Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming to my story. Well, what a huge screen. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, I'm going to start with a story because this talk is about storytelling, right? In a bustling city where skyscrapers touch the clouds and the st streets are buzzed with life, there was a young boy named Bart. While other kids were out playing soccer or riding their bikes, Bart was mesmerized by the glow of his computer screen, crafting digital realms for organizations at the tender age of only 14 years old. For him, computers weren't just machines. They were portals to endless worlds of creativity. Yet, as the years passed by, Bart's path took a different turn. Instead of diving deeper into the binary world, he ventured into the realm of communication science. But why? Some said it was a detour, but for Bart it was a bridge. A bridge that connected his love for technology with his passion for stories and storytelling, and for people. With a master's degree in his hand, and an entrepreneurial spirit that couldn't be tamed, Bart set out on a mission. A mission to inspire, to connect, to bring developers together, just not through lines of code, but through tales of triumphs, failures, dreams, and aspirations. He organized meetups, he mentored speakers, and even set up conferences, this Bart. But there was one summit he aimed for, one stage he dreamt of, DevOps, the pinnacle of Java conference in, uh, in Europe. And year after year, he proposed talks, hoping to share his vision on this grand stage. And after countless attempts, here he is, standing before you. Not as a mere speaker, but as a testament to perseverance, passion, and the power of storytelling. Bart always believed in people over processes, in finding that one spark, that common ground where magic happens when people work together, where a simple ID transforms into a groundbreaking software application, where a mere thought becomes a revolution. Now, as we dive into my talk, remembers Bart's journey. Remember that it's not just about the codes or the algorithms or the things you learn here this week, but it's about stories, making connections, and the indomitable human spirit. So, welcome to my talk about narrative engineering, unleashing the power of storytelling. My name is not Bart, that's my nephew. Uh, my name is Ramon Wieleman, I'm uh, Dutch, I'm married to my wife, uh, Anne, I'm a father of Emma, and I'm an Ajax fan. I'm the first speaker in a glittering suit at DevOps ever. This morning I saw all the highlights from the previous year, and with such a suit I think I can't miss it for the upcoming years to be in it. Uh, I'm a certified beer brewer and beer taster, uh, so if you want to know something about beers later on, uh, you know how to find me. When I was young, I earned uh, a living by selling newspapers in shopping malls. That's where you learn how to tell a story, how to convince people. Uh, I'm the founder of Code Nomads, a uh, senior Java developer group. Uh, I run the Amsterdam Jug for years. Uh, I'm in the program committee of Tech Nation, and you can follow me on Twitter. So what are we going to do today? I'm going to try to unleash the power of storytelling to all of you. So I first tell a bit about what storytelling is, because we need definitions then how storytelling works in business and at work, but also how to do it yourself, how to craft a good story, and how you can implement it in your software engineering. So, what is, why is storytelling important? First, we need to define what it is. I found a really long quote in order to find this. This is what Wikipedia says. It's the art and practice of conveying a series of events in words, sound, images, or a combination. And stories can entertain, educate, or install moral values. So with a story, you, you feel emotions. The characters, it needs a character, it needs a setting and a plot that can capture the interest of the audience that are engaging in the story. You can present it in various mediums, and it connects the teller to his audience. There needs to be synergy. Some smart people, what do they say instead of really long definitions? So Michael Margolis, the CEO of Storied, 
uh, a person I can highly recommend you to follow. Uh, his company is specialized in storytelling in IT. Uh, the stories we tell literally make the world. Without stories, there would be not the world as we know it. If you want to change the world, you need to change your story. The purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think. I'm not going to tell you how you need to think, but I'm trying to give you questions that you need to think upon in themselves. And storytelling reveals meaning without committing the error of defining it. So it's abstract. So storytelling goes back for centuries. It unites us. It, it unites peoples across cultures, but also across generations. The stories we now know about religion are centuries old and are passed on from one generation to the other. And the stories don't change. And the morals of the stories don't change. We need stories to make sense of the world around us, of understanding our place in it and our place in history, and it, to be able to connect with others. So craftsmanship, that's what storytelling is. It's story crafting, because every time a story is told, you try to tweak it to engage more with your audience. It, you need to carefully select and arrange the elements of the story to create a compelling narrative. Probably you know that you're in a bar with friends, and you have old friends, and you go way back, and you tell a story from 20 years ago about something funny. But every time the story is told, it gets more ridiculous and more crazy every time you tell it. This is because you know it will engage with the audience. So, so far, it's also craftsmanship. You keep crafting your code, keep making it better, uh, until you find the story that you want to tell with your code. So, why do people like storytelling, and why, do, why is it so effective? Because, well, we activate multiple areas of our brain. So, we, we experience senses when we hear a story. We develop emotions towards a story. But also, we make a memory out of the stories that we hear. What is the nice thing about stories is that it can simplify really complex things so that we can remember it better. And our brains are wired to think in narratives. Um, we need to find patterns to make connections between those events. And it's easier to remember a narrative than a list of facts. When I was in high school and you need to learn German words, I always try to make a story of the words instead of keep repeating it. So, let's try that. You see here on the sheet, my very educated mother just served us noodles. Very random sentence that you don't hear on a daily basis. But so wait, it's a mem it is a horrible English word that Dutch people can't pronounce. Mnemonic, yes. Or in Dutch, an ezelsbruggeltje. If you take the first letters, somebody got a clue what it means? Sorry? The planets. Yes, this is the planets in the right order. So instead of remembering what is the order of all the planets, you try to find one sentence, remember it, and that from there on you can go. So the power of emotions, so stories evoke emotions. And emotions can impact our behavior. If we feel very strong about it, if we have an opinion, we are going to act upon it. For example, we feel empathy and compassion um, when there's a war going on and there are refugees. Um, you see children in refugee camps. You feel an emotion and empathy to make a donation to uh, UNICEF. But for example, in our uh, industry, you have code.org. Who knows code.org? Couple of hands. Well, it's good that I here do a bit of advertisement. It's an education innovation nonprofit uh, that has a vision to uh, provide every uh, everybody with the right computer education, and especially minorities, um, women, and children in poorly developed countries. But also fear and anxiety are very strong emotions. So everybody wears a helmet when they're on a racing bike. We give our children helmets, not because we fell ourselves on our head, but we know what's going on, so we tell a story. You need to wear a helmet or else you can get serious injury. So fear is a very strong emotion to act. In our industry, well, we all have to fear that the application we build will lead to a giant data leak or the service will get hacked and we need to pay a lot of ransom. 
It's not because it happened to all of us, but the stories we heard and the stories we read on the news affect our behavior. And storytelling is as old as, human, as humankind. Uh, they do it to pass down knowledge, like I said, across generations. The ancient Greek used epic poems with life lessons for all ages. They passed it on and on and on. And the stories that the Greek poems, poets wrote centuries ago, we still learn it here in school. But also, storytelling builds communities. You help to create a shared sense of identity and a shared purpose. So you have national myths and legends that represent what a country or a region should be about, like gladiators in Rome and tales of emperors that are still told to this very day. In, in current times, you have it with sports teams. People associate with sports teams and identify them with the people who share the same, support the same team. But it can also inspire action. In the Second World War, the Germans bomb, uh, bombed London for years, every day, every night. And the speeches of Winston Churchill make sure that the Britons kept their fighting spirit, didn't surrender, and had actions. Every night he gave radio speeches that inspired the British people. So the stories we tell about our past, they influence our present and shape our future. It's a quote from me, and I think this sums it all up, what I said before. So how does it work in work, in a business? So storytelling helps to humanize brands. People connect with stories, not facts, not features. They connect with the story that they think uh, a company is doing well. But also, you can use stories to build trust among your users and your clients, because a well-crafted story can help to convey the company's values, beliefs, and intentions. For example, sustainability is a really good example of this. Tell stories how sustainable your organization is and what you do um, for the environment. But also, it inspires loyalty, because if you have an emotional connection with your customers, they also feel like it's a mutual relationship and they're more willing to buy your service and products. An example, long text. I'm not going to read it up. Somebody knows what it is? Apple. Yes. This is the famous Here's commercial the crazy ones. The rebels, the troublemakers, the ones who see things differently. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy <coughs> enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So this is the Think Different campaign from Apple from the 1998. And it became very successful. And it's a classic example of storytelling. Because they announced it that the Super Bowl it took 30 seconds and everybody's still talking about this commercial today. But if you think about it, they don't show people that work in IT, people without computers. They don't mention the word hardware, software, anything at all. But they sell you an ID and they try to create an emotional reaction. You also want to be a rebel. You also want to make a difference in people's lives. You want to be remembered for history. So they identify them with the rebels and the creatives. While, for example, Microsoft was focusing on the mass. They wanted to reach everybody. So this was a really successful campaign that Apple launched. And also, storytelling is represented in missions and visions of companies. I'm, uh, this is one of my things that I like to do, because it's crazy hard to do. Try to caption for your work for your voluntary work, for example, if you work at a sports club, or for yourself, try to write down in two sentences or one who you are, what you want to do, and what your goal is. It's the hardest thing to do. Try it out. I get also give homework here in the uh, late afternoon. For example, this is a mission from a company. If you have a buddy, you're an athlete. Who knows who it is? It's Nike. They don't say about the, the stuff they, they make, the clothes, the shoes, anything else. No, they treat everybody like an athlete. Everybody can do it. They don't focus on 
the professional athletes, but on everybody. Another one, to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy, a one-liner. Which company? No? It's Tesla. So the Tesla cars run on energy, hope, hopefully sustainable energy, and acceleration resembles the car. So it's really well thought of to put a car brand into one word without mentioning the word car. So let me tell you a personal story from my side. So how did I build my company, Code Nomads? In uh, Java, uh, in 2017, yes, 2017, I went to San Francisco with uh, many people from the Dutch Java user group. And uh, I was working as a community manager at the time for the Dutch Java user group. We went there with like 50 Dutch people. Uh, but I also was a startup founder. I had some product startup IDs, uh, very unsuccessful. But I wanted to pitch it, and I thought, well, if I go to San Francisco, before I get into the plane, I send some messages to angel investors in Silicon Valley and see what happens. And I arrived there, and suddenly I got a phone call. Hey, can you come to, uh, to our office tomorrow in Palo Alto, and we're happy to do a pitch. You can do your pitch. You have 10 minutes. I was like, holy shit. So uh, I rented a car, and uh, with some guys from the Dutch Java user group, we drove to Palo Alto. Uh, we went to Facebook when Facebook was still cool. Went to the Google campus, and I did my pitch. Very unsuccessful. And I thought, well, this is not for me, pitching for Silicon Valley uh, investors and do a product. But then, and I already saw some people in the crowd here that were, there, were at this party. We went with the Dutch people, went to a bar in San Francisco. And there, the ID came, I looked around me and there were many people in consultancy in the Netherlands having a lot of fun making impact at their clients with a lot of smart minds. And I thought, this is what I need to do. I need to build uh, a company, a consultancy company in Java in the Netherlands, but something different. And I lived in Amsterdam at the time, and I think in two years' time, all my neighbors became from Dutch to non-Dutch. And I saw potential, I came to clients uh, to banks in the Netherlands, and I saw that more and more international people were working there. I thought, let's do it. Let's go. So I wrote, half drunk on a piece of paper, a couple of things. Uh, and that's what Code Nomads was built upon. So a month later, I quit my job and a company was founded. This is December 2017, uh, signing the papers at the notary office. And, well, then I had a company. Well, yeah, what is a company, right? You pay the notary and then you have a company. So I thought, well, I need to tell a story. How do you attract people from all around the world to come to Code Nomads and to work for you? So I need to pitch a dream. I had no track record in consultancy. I never worked as a manager. I had no office, no money, no clients. But I tried to build a company that was in line with my per own personality. Uh, I like to share knowledge. I like to learn by talking to people. And I also have to drive to learn something new every day, make connections and have a passion for technology. So what I did, yeah, I had a, a very old MacBook Air and an iPhone with cracks in it. Um, but yeah, you need to interview people, right? You can't do a consultancy company without developers. Um, so yeah, I wrote a LinkedIn article, why I started Code Nomads, and this was my dream that I put in, in, in writing. And people actually read it. I started to speak at, at a conference in the Netherlands about how to automate the beer brewing process. Quite nice. Hand out some beers, you get five-star ratings. It's perfect. So you build a track record. And then, uh, well, Brian Gutz in 2018, February 2018, came to the Netherlands. And I said, well, can I sponsor? I didn't have one developer working. But I was interviewing many people. And I said, hey, next week Brian Gutz is coming. Uh, come to the meetup, I'll fix you a, a spot. And, uh, well, as you can see, he was standing right in front of the banner that I designed two days before. So I had a great marketing material. But still no developers. But this story, because of the story, I, I started to believe more and more in my own story. And people came. People came all the way from Brazil. They left their home and they left their family. Uh, from Russia, from Iran, India, Australia. And suddenly, oh, suddenly, after a year, there were 12 people working. And I thought, holy shit, we have a company. People bought a dream. But after a while, it started to itch a bit. And I thought, hey, we're now a well-established company. 
we should be more proud of what we do. So we needed to tell a new story. And I wanted to, I'm like visual driven, so I wanted to create a new story that's in line with the designs, that it feels mesmerizing with the colors, a new website, new pictures. And we wanted to be more proud of what we did, more proud of what we achieved. So we put the developers with all the pictures and the profile section on the website. All the recruiters told me I was crazy to put very good developers with their names and their Twitter handles on your website. But uh, we were proud of what we were doing. So a new story. Oh shit, commercial. Uh, tomorrow, Java pub quiz. Uh, I'm also presenting with two of my colleagues. Make sure to compete. Uh, we'll also hand out free beer. And uh, during that, oh, uh, but don't tell Stefan. Uh, so feel, make sure to uh, compete tomorrow. So that was it for the commercials. So how to craft a good story? What are key ingredients of a, of a good story? Well, you need a few things. You need a protagonist, a compelling one. So the main character of the story, who is the main character? Because the character drives the actions and makes the decisions that move a story forward. Uh, it needs to be a character that people can relate with or empathize with. And the character needs to have clear goals, uh, clear motivations, and also comes with flaws. Because if it's Mr. Perfect, it's not really compelling to listen to. Then the setting. The setting of a story needs to be vivid. Uh, it's the, the setting in which the entire story takes place. It's not only location, but also time period and cultural context. Um, and it needs to be described into detail, but not too detailed. So the audience needs to be able to think about it, imagine how they think it would look like. A story is not a story without a clear conflict. So the main character should have a conflict with someone. He needs, there's a struggle or a challenge that the main character must overcome. And this is the driving force. So the main character needs to solve a problem. You need to define the problem well, and the stakes need to be high for the main character. If it's something he doesn't really care about, you lose the sense of the story. Because conflicts, that creates tension in a story and suspense. So you keep invested to know what the outcome is as an audience. But also the resolution of the conflict at the end needs to be satisfying for the audience. So the conflict is revolved, the main character achieved his goal or he learned something new. It's not always a good story, right? With a good outcome. And a good resolution, it ties up all the loose ends. So all the problems and challenges that came throughout the story needs to be solved. So what is a bad story then? For example, let's take Sherlock Holmes as an example here. What if Sherlock Holmes was an underdeveloped main ca character? So he lacks depth, he lacks complexity, he's a really flat character. For example, a detective with no personal life or Sherlock being happy is something that we can hardly visit. He just does his work, he's a detective, 40 hours a week. Uh, he goes on holiday in a caravan, that's it. What if there's no vivid setting? So it's just a city with no description of the neighborhoods, the time era, you lose interest because you don't know, you can't imagine what's going on for yourself. What if there's no conflict? So Sherlock is like a detective, but he doesn't really care about it. He's also look, he's talking to recruiters for other jobs in other industries and he doesn't really care about what's going on. It lacks tension, he just does his job and then he goes home. Or what the res if the resolution is unsatisfying? He didn't tie up all the loose ends. He caught the killer, doesn't know why, just got lucky, end of story. So try to remember this. So a good main character with a problem, a good vivid setting, a clear conflict and a satisfying resolution at the end. So how does storytelling apply in software development, the industry that we work in? So how can you use storytelling? Well, storytelling simplifies complex concepts, but also it fosters col collaboration among team members, um, but you can also get your users on board and you can use it to advance in your career. And let me clarify on this a bit. So simplifying complexities. Most of us work on in, 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 in applications that are crazy complex. For example, they work at a big bank where there are hundreds of teams and you're just a small piece of the puzzle. 
And the algorithms you build, the software you build, it's crazy complex. If a new person comes into the team, it takes him six, seven months before he actually understands what they're building. So we need to find a narrative. Um, also for non-technical stakeholders, like people in business uh, that are involved. Or junior developers that need coaching in what they're doing. So instead of giving like them like the entire, explain them all the code and all the algorithm, try to find a narrative that they can relate to. So for example, if you have a really complex algorithm in your stat, instead of explaining it, you could create a story that explains it, explains it in a real world scenario. So for example, you can create characters that represent different components of the algorithm, or you describe how they interact with each other to solve a problem. A uh, good example here is, for example, a librarian. How does a librarian source book in a library? What are the different steps that the librarian needs to take in order to store the books, to check who rented the book, and also how he puts it back? I, uh, a few weeks ago, I put on Twitter, hey, who got a good example of storytelling that simplifies a technical concept in your industry? And uh, Tom Coles, Belgian jack leader uh, here, came up with a really good example. It's gently down the stream. And I never heard of it, but it's brilliant. Uh, there's this guy who built a website that looks like a story, that reads like a story, uh, how you uh, learn Kafka. It's about two authors who are sending messages to each other, but they like each other and a group of authors grew. So how are they dealing with it? And he wrote it like a book for children. And every time the, authors, the more authors came, they needed to go down the stream with their messages. But everybody needed to read the message at the same time. So how are they doing this? It's a brilliant story. You can, if for the people who have children, go to gently down the stream or scan the QR code and you'll be amazed. So something complex that can be simplified for kids. For example, it's hardly readable, but I asked ChatGPT, what is a neural network? And I got an explanation about neurons, biases, activation function. I was like, holy shit, brain bust. How I why is it so complex to learn what a neural network is? Well, my daughter, Emma, when she was one and, years, one and a half years old, was reading a book, Neural Networks for Babies. It's a brilliant book. In 16 pages, with very simple images, they explain how neural networks work. So why are we as... Software developers always try to explain complex things, more complex, because you want to show off that you are very knowledgeable. It's way more difficult to explain difficult things in a simple way than the other way around. So in our industry, the days of Hollywood stereotypes of a developer is over. You're not in your hoodie anymore in the basement coding on your own. We're collaborating. Software development is about team collaboration. But in order to collaborate, you need a shared understanding of, well, the project goals, uh, the challenge there are, but also what are the roles of every team member in the team, and what are their responsibilities, and also what are not their responsibilities. So you need to be aligned in order to be successful as a team. Probably some of you know here what the Spotify model is, because Spotify is a great example of this. They grew like crazy. Every day they were starting new developers and new teams. And collaborating for them became more and more difficult. Because they had problems because they grow so fast and they couldn't exchange information anymore. But they found a way for that. So they, they created a narrative-driven model. So they were not, say, giving like a list of problems or challenges that they had. But they created the so-called autonomous quad narrative. So they came up with a story. They say, every team we have here is a ship. Imagine a fleet of ships that we have set out to explore the fast ocean, which is the software landscape. If every ship needs to wait for like centralized commands, they might miss out this on discovering on new islands or somebody else beat them to it and find the island before. So these are like innovations. But if each separate ship is empowered to make decisions, find its own course, but it knows its final destination, the fleet can cover more ground together. So Spotify reframed their teams as squads, and each squad was completely autonomous, like an individual ship, 
and with the authority to make the decisions. But all the squads were still allied to a common strategic goal, but had the freedom to decide themselves on the how. So how did this work in real life? So you have the ship story in mind. So the teams had their own purpose and their own autonomy. And it was for them not about coding new features, fixing bugs. No, it was about exploration and discovery, how the people at Spotify called it. So we were exploring. And this led to better collaboration within the team, but also throughout the teams. So squads came together to share their maps from the land that they discovered. And share their discovery tales, so what did they find on the way? Uh, to ensure that the entire fleet benefited from their discovery. And by doing this, it moved away the conversation from meeting targets and KPIs that they need to do to exploring and innovating. And this fostered like collabor uh, collaboration and agility within Spotify. Another example of storytelling is user engagement you can enhance. So user engagement is, is a pivotal metric in, 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 in our industry because an engaged user is more likely to continue to use a product to re recommend it to others and to provide you valuable feedback. You don't give feedback to products you don't like or associate with. And I'm a nerd for like, uh, if there's an update version, I always read like the release notes. Uh, because there's what the story are told, what the developers are trying to tell you. So try to find, if you do this, for example, tr if you write documentation, try to align with the end user or with your own team to reflect the personality of the team in it. So for example, Duolingo always does it, um, and their mascot is an owl, and he's trading his mice for bucks this week. A nice thing that you can relate to with the owl. Another one, uh, this one I saved years ago, is from Medium. Uh, it's hard to read, but Peter let a couple nasty, it's in the bottom, Peter let a couple nasty bugs slip into our last release. This has been fixed. We fired Peter. I don't know if it's true, but I hope it's true. So next time you update something, read the notes, because some of them are really funny. But also, how can you relate if you develop software? How can you enhance with your users? So for example, imagine you're building a new fitness application, right? Everybody wants to be health, healthy and fit. But instead of just presenting the users with a dashboard of like metrics and, 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 and objectives that you need to have with the exercises written down, what if you use gamification and you create Alex, a virtual fitness body? So Alex stories mirrors the user journey in, in, uh, in his fitness program. So you start working out together, you see him grow, you see him getting more slim, more muscular, but you set goals together so you relate. It's your, basically your fitness avatar. And gamification is used in many of these uh, fitness applications and sport applications. Again, storytelling. Use storytelling to boost your career. Because in my opinion, career advancement as a software developer is not only about growing your technical skills. You can be very good, you can be very knowledgeable, but if nobody knows or you're not able to communicate it to others, it's not very effective. So make, try to make a well-told story that can articulate your achievements in a compelling manner that you can say. Make it memorable for your peers, your superiors, or potential employers. Uh, and it also can help you to, for your future ambitions that resonate and that showcase what you have been doing and what you're heading for. So make yourself memorable by wearing a glitter suit at a conference. I don't advise it because it's crazy hot. But make yourself memorable in a positive way, also very important. People can also memorize you because you did something really bad or because you didn't make a very good impression. But try to distinct yourself from other people. For example, in my company, I did many recruitment interviews over the last few years. And what I hear so much, what I hear most of the time when I ask, well, tell me something about yourself. They all say, well, I'm a senior software developer with X amount of years of experience, and then start to name up all the companies they worked on in a chronological order. 
And I always think, well, I could have written this in the resume that I already read. So who are you? Why are you here? And what is your unique skill? So for example, how I would do it, narrate a story that, 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 that particularly fits with the audience you're telling it to. Describe what you did and not what the team did that you worked. So for example, you can des describe, well, you worked in a project, there were some initial sitbacks because the team was uh, too small. Uh, there was a lot of technical depth that we need to get rid of. But throughout innovative solutions, uh, good recruitment, you did some meetups that people came, uh, you hired them, you worked a lot of weekends and late nights, but with the team you had a good connection. And finally you did the deployment and you succeeded and the product was successful. Because if you describe it in such a way, instead of just reading up your resume, it shapes your aspirations to lead and to mentor a team because you show that you can face bigger uh, challenges and that you can drive innovation. So it's way more powerful that to describe what you did than saying that you are a team player and that you are passionate about technology. Show, don't tell. For example, you're walking around here at the DevOps marketplace. There are many great companies. Um, maybe a company that's like your dream goal. You think, well, I go to university and then I'm going to work for a company like one of them downstairs. And you speak to one of the people who work there and they say, hey, you're here as a senior software developer. We are looking for good people. Pitch yourself. And this is your dream, right? So how do you pitch yourself? If you say, hey, hello, my name is John. I'm a senior software developer. I work at company Y. I work in FinTech and I increased performance, uh, I increased performance with 8% last year, which led to a, bu uh, uh, a loss in budget of like 400K. All right. But I think 90% of the people in the room have the same thing. So how do you stand out? So think about this tonight. If you find somebody here that offers you, wants to offer you a dream job, how do you showcase yourself? And make a connection with your own personality and make it memorable. Make sure that the other person who meets thousands of other developers remembers you instead of the other. How are you going to do that? The biggest frustration of software developers is that the business doesn't understand the technical debt needs to be fixed, but the business only wants new features while you see it's going wrong. So the business wants, well, to meet the market demands, customer needs, they got feedback, so they want you to build something new. They see opportunities, they see a lot of revenues, and if we don't do it, our competitors will. But on the other hand, we as developers, we see the underlying architecture, the shortcuts we have taken in the past already, the quality that we neglected in order to, to go fast. But we also see the looming cost of the architecture that we built. So how to tell this to non-technical stakeholders? Well, there's a story that you can use, right? That will probably speak to the mind of a manager or a product owner. So imagine you build a city or a building on shaky foundations. So it worked. But over time, as new buildings come, the risk of a collapse increases. So you build a foundation for a small house. Um, but the house is on a very good location. It's always sunny. There's a river. There's a nice bar next to it. So more people want to come. And then they say, oh, we should build an extra floor on top of it because we can sell it for a lot of money. If we make a skyscraper, we can grow. And every we add a new layer, a new layer, a new, a new apartment. And this is what technical debt is. Because it might work for now, and as it grows, it probably will work. It's still a bit shaky. But suddenly, the risk of a major issue increases with every layer you put on top of it. And the cost of fixing it while it's still two floors and it collapses is way lower than when 20 floors collapse. Try to use this as a narrative the next time some your manager doesn't understand why you should upgrade and why you should have time for the team to, to, to get rid of it. 
And also what I noticed in, in, in my career is that there's always like, if you're talking about technical depth versus new features, there's always this collision. Business under doesn't understand what we're doing. And business says the developers only want to work with the latest version instead of building it. But try to understand that there's mutual understanding because everybody's still on the same team, right? Everybody still wants to succeed. So somehow you need to collaborate. And by doing effective storytelling, you can get this shared understanding. So you ensure that both immediate business goals plus long-term product health are prioritized. Keep talking to each other and try to find a narrative that resembles it. So I got like 10 minutes left. So what have I, what have I been telling here? So what are like the key takeaways and next steps for you to do? Because, well, not everybody is a born storyteller. Not everybody is confident of telling a story, for example, to their manager who is really extrovert and really eloquent, while you might be less. So how to do it? So storytelling, in my opinion, is a powerful tool to make complexity simple to enhance collaboration and also drive engagement. But storytelling is also like coding. There are many similarities because it requires practice, it, re it requires structure, and also creativity. So where to start? Well, begin by identifying the core message or the moral of your own story. So make a mission or a vision. Write down in one sentence what you want, who you are and what you should be about. Think about what your narrative will be if you go here to the exhibitor floor tomorrow. How do you stand out? Why are you different than other people here? who look probably a lot like you. But also it's about authenticity. So I was selling newspapers in shopping malls and sometimes you sell nothing so you don't earn a living. And then you see the guy next to you selling one newspaper subscription after the other. And you think, well, I'm trying to copy a story and still nothing. So it needs to be authentic. You need to have a story. It only resonates with people if they believe your story. So don't copy a story that somebody else says. Craft it around real experience and make it your own and keep crafting it. And you can only become a good storyteller if you keep practicing. Try practicing every time. Try to explain technical concepts to friends who are not in IT. Try to explain it to your partner at home. Try to write a children's book about a new technology that you're working with. But also, not everybody is an extrovert and, for example, capable of or willing to stand here on a stage like this. But try to stand up at the birthday dinner with family and tell a story. Make an entertaining story. It doesn't need to about, be about anything. Also, a thing I do, I don't read book for my daughter. I stop doing that. I'm trying to come up with my own stories and see what works. Or I ask her for, hey, this is, what, this is what your day was about. Let's make a story out of that together. If it's hard for you, use ChatGPT to make bedtime stories for your kid, children together. And then when you have a, a solid base, together you can find other ways, other directions that the main character of the story can do. But also, yeah, feedback and storytelling just like software is gold. So incorporate it, refine your narrative. I noticed that some of the jokes or things I said don't resonate well, so next time I'll get it out and I try to polish it. But adopt it and make a connection with the audience that is here. And a final thought, so every line of code that we write as well also tells a story. So make sure that the lines of code you write are compelling. Make sure it triggers other people to read it and to work on it and keep crafting it. So I didn't came up with all these ideas myself, so I have a few minutes left so I can do some recommended reading on, on, on books that inspired me. Uh, Simon Simek uh, got a really good book on Start With Why. Who read it? Oh, I thought half the room would lift his hands. It's a really good book. He says, what he says in the book is start with the why instead of the how and the what. So he called it the golden circle. So most companies start with the what, so their product or service, and then move to the how, their process or value proposition. 
but few companies can clearly articulate why they do what they do. So, and the most successful companies like Apple, for example, and leaders, they start with the why. So why are we going to do this? Not how we are going to do this and what we're going to do, but why. And there's the power in this, because you can use it in every time. Founding a company you don't do to make money, because money is a result. It's about why. What is your cause? What's your belief? What's your dream? Try to resonate that in every message you send internally, externally. And it's the reason your company exists. Um, also, the role of trust, he describes. If you have a good why and you're able to articulate why you do things, you build a level of trust because people know that the message you sent is consistent and real. I don't, I don't believe companies that like put their goals and achievements in money only because I don't think you can measure it like that, why a company is successful. Um, Simon Samek also has like a lot of TED Talks that are about this, so if you're not about books, just watch your video. It's really good. Another book I read last year, I got it from a friend of mine, is, is a book called Never Split the Difference, and it's about negotiating from Chris Foss, and Chris Foss is a former FBI hostage negotiator. And the guy did like all the famous hostage situation in the US from the last 30 years. He was the one negotiating. It's really good if you want to buy a house or a car. Read this book first because it will save you a lot of money. So what he says is empathic listening. So you can listen to people using tactical empathy, he calls it, and just listen and validate their feelings. Listen what they have to say. You can build trust by listening. Don't talk all too much. And he used the so-called mirroring technique. So when people are talking, you notice, usually in the final words of their statement that they're really emotional about, it just repeats it. And if you repeat the, the final words of their emotional statement, they are likely to continue talking about it. Another thing that he says, avoid saying yes, but aim for no. I always learned in sales that you need to get as much yes from people uh, as much as possible. So when I was selling newspapers, I always said, you, also, you can read, right? Yes. Do you, like, do you try to keep up with the news? Yes. So you want to make them committed to the cause. But he says, no, aim for the no, because when people say no, they thought about it and they feel they're in control. So don't try to lure people in by letting them say yes, because this is short-term gain and not long-term. The other thing he says is the 7, 38, 55% rule. Because 7% is about what you say, 30% is from the tone of voice you have, and 55% is from body language and facial expressions. So I read this book, and I can now deal way better with a three-year-old daughter who wants uh, candy for breakfast. Use it. Use empathic listening and a mirroring technique. My wife started to notice that suddenly uh, I was getting a lot of favors from her. And she said, what, what book are you reading? Well, read this book. Uh, another book that uh, there is is from John Walls is The Art of Storytelling. So many things that I said here, you got a lot of practical tips. Uh, why, what, why storytelling throughout the century is so effective. But also how to structure a good story and also how to make it personal and authentic. Um, it's really a hands-on book. It really helps you to, for every situation to come up with stories. But also explains the role of imagination. So if you describe a problem or setting, let your audience imagine instead of that you just name a list of facts. He also has really good sections on how to deliver a story, how to talk, how to move with your body, how to uh, present and how to do it. It's an old book, but very good. Uh, and finally, a book that helped me a lot in, 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 in storytelling and product design is uh, the, 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 um, the book from Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. Because, well, Steve Jobs always said that he worked in the intersection of technology and art. So, he, one of the things I remember, he said, before I date the iPhone, I wanted to make a smartphone. If I did a survey of how the iPhone should look like, probably people said that they wanted a keyboard instead of a glass phone without a keyboard. So, think, on, think of your own and combine great design with new technology. 
but also put attention to detail. So this is also about your story. When you do something, put attention to detail. He, he uh, postponed the launch of the iMac for, for years because he wanted to speak to the computer and the s computers need to speak back. All the developers were getting crazy about it. My time is up. So it means I came to the end of my slide. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you have questions or want to meet, I'm here uh, at the conference all week. Tonight I'll be in a bar around Central Station. So if you have questions, want to share feedback, uh, feel free to approach me or reach me out on Twitter or X, how it's called. Thank you all for listening to my story and have a great conference. <laughs>